in our last episode, we examined the times and the music, the first part, the winter months of 1968. So now it's time to continue our magical history tour of 1968 and move into the spring. Is there going to be a lot more great music? Oh, you bet there is. Let's drop the needle. April roars in like a lion. But before we look at music, let's talk about this movie that came out, April 3rd, 1968, 2001, A Space Odyssey. Whoa, what a mind trip that was. And I have to tell you my experience of seeing that movie for the very first time. As I mentioned in the last episode, at this point in my life, I was going to school at the University, Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Illinois. Now at that time, Carbondale was a pretty small town. There was one record store that I would go and frequent and buy my albums at, and there was one movie theater. Well, on Saturday night, that movie theater was going to show 2001. Now I had heard so much about this movie that I definitely wanted to go see it. So I did on Saturday night. Now the problem was, on Friday nights, that movie theater would host frat stag parties with adult movies. And apparently that Friday night, one of the frat brothers got so upset about whatever was going on in the porn movie that he picked up a six pack and threw it right through the screen, <laughs> causing a big hole right in the center of the projection screen. But that didn't detour the movie management. They just decided to go right on ahead. So when I go in to see 2001, I'm watching it and right in the center of the screen is this black hole where the six pack went through. Made for a very weird experience. Now you remember in the movie when all the apes were kind of running around that black monolith and then one of them grabs a bone and flings the bone and the bone goes up into the sky and into space and becomes the floating space station? <laughs> well, that's not what I saw. What I saw was the ape pick up the bone and he flings it and it goes into this black hole in the center of the screen. And then there's all this music and then there's kind of a white circular thing around the hole and then it kind of moves and that was the space station. <laughs> it was kind of a weird experience, I gotta tell you. But that Stargate thing at the end, whoa, what a psychedelic trip that was. And the next year after I transferred out to LA, I went to the Cinerama Dome and saw it again. <laughs> there was no hole in the middle of the screen this time, and it was a totally, totally different movie. What a trip. Also on that same day, April 3rd, another sci-fi movie was released, and it starred Charlton Heston. Okay, maybe it was a little bit hokey, Planet of the Apes, but it did spawn a franchise <laughs> that went on for quite some time. And the very next day, back here on Earth, which had been April 4th, 1968, tragedy strikes in the heartland of America as Martin Luther King is assassinated in Memphis. On a lighter note, there were some pretty amazing albums that came out in the spring of 1968. And in April, one of them <laughs> was a little bit weird. Do you recognize Herbert Boutris Kahuri? Doesn't ring a bell? Well, he went by the stage name of Tiny Tim. <laughs> And his first and most popular album was released in April called God Bless Tiny Tim. It contains the hits Tiptoe Through the Tulips With Me, Living in the Sunlight, Loving in the Moonlight, and the Sonny and Cher hit I Got You Babe, where he sings both parts, the baritone and the falsetto. Now, if you were alive in 1968, you probably remember and you probably watched, like 40 million other people, the Johnny Carson Show and you watch Tiny Tim marry Miss Vicky on the Johnny Carson Show live on Nationwide TV. He also appeared in 1968 on the Beatles Christmas record that they recorded for their fan club. If you're interested, I talked about those Christmas albums in a previous episode. You might want to check it out. They're pretty cool. Tiny Tim went on to record and appear on many TV shows. Sadly, he died of a heart attack while he was performing tiptoe through the tulips on stage in Minneapolis. Also in April, Simon and Garfunkel released their fourth studio album. It's called Bookends. Side one is kind of a concept side in that it goes through the story of life from childhood to old age. Songs include Save the Life of My Child, Old Friends, and the amazing song America. 
a side two, contains a bunch of outtakes that were recorded originally for the movie The Graduate. You get the hit Mrs. Robinson, which interesting, just the year before in 1967, won the record of the year at the Grammys and was the first rock record to do so. Other songs are Faking It, A Hazy Shade of Winter, and At the Zoo. In 1968, the made-for-TV band The Monkees had their TV show canceled, and their movie had, well, it flopped. But that didn't stop them from releasing their fifth album, The Birds, The Bees, and The Monkees. Now, over the years, the band members had fought hard to, for the right to record their own songs and to play their own instruments on the record. Well, they won. They got that. But this album got <clears throat> a little weird in that one member would be working with studio musicians in one studio while another member would be with studio musicians in another studio. So it's kind of indicative of 1968, I guess. The album is really all over the place. But it does contain some hits like Daydream Believer and Valerie and some great Mike Nesmith songs like Tapioca Tundra and Magnolia Sims. But our next album is a stunner and it's one of those that I would take with me to a desert island. It's the Zombies, and the album is Odyssey and Oracle. Now, it was recorded in 1967, and in fact, in December of 1967, the band broke up. So when the album was released in 1968, in April, they had already gone their separate ways. But what an album. The songs are all great. Standouts are Care of Cell 44, A Rose for Emily, Brief Candles, Maybe After He's Gone, I Want Her, She Wants Me, this will be our year, Butcher's Tale, Western Front, 1914, and of course, the big hit, Time of the Season. Check out this record. I can't praise it enough. It's great. We started the month of April with an odd artist in Tiny Tim, so it's appropriate we end April with another odd artist. His name is Lawrence Wayne Fisher, and his debut album is a double album, and it's produced by Frank Zappa. The album, An Evening with Wild Man Fisher. Fisher was a street musician who would scat for nickels and dimes on the streets of Hollywood and down on the beach around Santa Monica. And he was in and out of mental institutions. <laughs> so I guess you can kind of see why Frank Zappa would be attracted to this guy to put him on Zappa's label, Bizarre Records. Probably the best known Fisher song is the lead off, Merry Go Round. But I can't say that I really like any of the songs, but the titles are interesting. New Kind of Song for Sales, Are You From Clovis, The Leaves Are Falling, Monkeys vs. Donkeys, The Taster, Think of Me When Your Clothes Are Off, Why Am I Normal, and Balling Isn't Everything. This clearly is an album that's not for everyone. But it's interesting to note that Zappa and the GTOs, which were girls together outrageously, who also appeared on Bizarre Records, appear on Fisher's album. It could only happen in LA. Moving up the coast of San Francisco, we're treated to the debut album of a new band called Creedence Clearwater Revival. The band is made up of two brothers. John Fogarty is the lead singer, guitarist, and songwriter. His brother Tom Fogarty on rhythm guitar, Stu Cook on bass, and Doug Clifford on drums. The band had been playing together for a number of years as the Gollywogs, but not to much success. But that all changed with the release of this album. It contains the huge hit, Susie Q. I Put a Spell on You, 99 and a Half Won't Do, and two songs that they recorded when they were still the Gollywogs, Porterville and Walk on the Water. This is an album that's clearly out of step with most of the music in the Times in 1968. I mean, there's no psychedelia. There's no extended guitar solos. It's just all kind of swampy music. Now, Creedence Clearwater Revival had an amazing career before they disbanded in flames just a few short years later. But another band from the Bay Area who definitely grabbed the psychedelic sound was Quicksilver Messenger Service, and their debut album also came out in 1968. The band was formed by Dino Valenti, lead vocal and rhythm guitar, John Cipollino on lead guitar, David Freeberg on bass, Skip Spence on guitar, now, Spence quickly left to join Jefferson Airplane as their drummer. He was replaced by Greg Elmore. Like so many acts, they had actually performed the year before at the Monterey Pop Festival and got a record deal. 
This album contains some jams and lighter songs. The lead-off song is Pride of Man. I also like Dino's song. Now, interestingly enough, this was written by Dino Valenti while he was in prison on a drug charge. I also like Gold and Silver and the 12-minute jam, The Fool. The band went on to record eight albums, but the lineup in the band kept changing. Now we start our trip across the ocean. And we'll stop first at the Azores, which are islands off of Spain, because in 1968, a submarine, the USS Scorpion, went down with everyone on board killed. There were many inquiries to figure out what exactly happened to the Scorpion, but to this day, it's still pretty much a mystery. Continuing up the coast, we arrive in London, where the group The Small Faces released their third album, and it's a great one. And I've talked about it before in a previous episode about The Small Faces because it's a unique album. I mean, look at the cover. The cover is round, very expensive to make, and it does make it kind of difficult to keep it standing upright in the record collection. But since I covered The Small Faces extensively in a previous episode, I'm not going to review this album here, but check it out. It's great. Meanwhile, the tragedies of 1968 continue. The Vietnam War is still raging. President Johnson is not a popular man, so a couple of Democrats decide to campaign for president against him. One is Eugene McCarthy, and the other is Robert F. Kennedy, past attorney general and brother of the late president, John F. Kennedy. On June the 5th, after winning the primaries in both South Dakota and California, Robert F. Kennedy is leaving a campaign event in Los Angeles where he is assassinated. This is just two months after Martin Luther King was assassinated. America is reeling. But back in the U.S. on the West Coast in San Diego, a band records a 17-minute song that becomes a classic. The band is Iron Butterfly, and the song is In Agata De Vida. Although there are other songs in this album, I'm sure most of us don't remember any of them except In Agata De Vida. And In Agata De Vida has an interesting story behind it. It was written by Doug Ingle, and he asked Ron Bushy to write down the lyrics as he sang them to him, except Doug was so drunk and so slurred that Bushy couldn't figure out what he was singing. So he wrote down what he heard. He wrote down In Agata De Vida. What the song was really called was In the Garden of Eden. FM radio played the heck out of this track. There was so much clamor for the song that the record label decided they would cut it down to a three-minute version and release it as a single, which they did. The album sold and sold. It peaked at number four on the charts. And for 1968, it was the biggest selling album of the year. And for many years, it was the biggest selling album in the label's history. Yes, it seems like 1968 was a year of excess. And this next band lives up to that. For their third album, the Cream release a double live album called Wheels of Fire. Jack Bruce, Eric Clapton, and Ginger Baker pull out all the stops on this amazing album. The first disc contains two sides of songs recorded in the studio, leading off with the great white room. When I first heard this song, I instantly ran out and bought a device for my guitar because I was playing in my band, and it was called a crybaby. <laughs> It was a wah-wah pedal that you would step on that would give you the sound that Clapton had in White Room. I had to have one so that we could play that song. Next up is Sitting on Top of the World, Ginger's Passing the Time, and Pressed Rat and Warthog, Jack's Blistering Politician, and Born Under a Bad Sign. The second disc is recorded live, and it contains only four songs. But what songs? Crossroads and Spoonful where Eric just explodes, Train Time, a Jack Bruce stunner, and Ginger's 16-minute drum solo, Toad. And in June, I return home from college and decide, got to resurrect the band, The Darkness. We need to go out and play some more gigs. Except, at this point, our lead guitarist, Bruce Minot, had left because he was going to college. So, what are we going to do? Well, then I remembered a childhood friend of mine his name was Bill Tel Telfer, and he played guitar, but he also played a number of other instruments. Well, it turned out he was actually playing at a house band at a casino in Las Vegas, and he came home for the summer. And so Bill and I got together and started talking, and I said, hey, 
why don't you come and play guitar with us? Well, he brought a whole new dimension to the darkness because Bill Telfer could play extended jam solos. So we could play songs like the Cream songs and that kind of stuff. So we decided to move into a much more psychedelic phase. And we decided to make home movies of ourselves. And here is some of those films shot in 1968 on Super 8. I just transferred them and the films kept breaking. But we made these movies and we would project them behind us when we were on stage as kind of a psychedelic light show going on behind us. <laughs> you can see from the films that we were kind of influenced by the Monkees and the Beatles and the Marx Brothers and, you, you know, <laughs> whatever. But I remember we played this one gig and we were really loud. And one of the girls came up to us and said, you're too loud. You need to turn it down. So what did we do? Turn the amps up even higher. <laughs> Rock and roll. Now this brings us to the halfway point of 1968. In the winter months, we discovered 12 albums. In spring, we talked about 10. Now in the next episode,